Chapter 5. The Island Come True. Feeling that Peter was on his way back, the Neverland had again awoke unto life. We ought to use the pluperfect and say, wakened. But woke is better, and was always used by Peter. In his absence, things are usually quiet on the island. Fairies take an hour longer in the morning, and beasts attend to their young. The redskins feed heavily for six days and nights, and when pirates and lost boys meet, they merely bite their thumbs at each other. But with the coming of Peter, who hates lethargy, they were all on their way again. If you put your ear to the ground now, you would hear the whole island seething with life. On this evening, the chief forces of the island were disposed as follows. The Lost Boys were out looking for Peter. The pirates were out looking for the Lost Boys. The Redskins were looking for the pirates, and the beasts were out looking for the Redskins. They were going round and round the island, but they did not meet, because they were going at the same rate. All wanted blood except the boys, who liked it as a rule, but tonight they were out to greet their captain. The boys on the island vary, of course, in numbers, according to when they get killed and so on. And when they seem to be growing up, which is against the rules, Peter thins them out. But at this time, there were six of them. You count the twins as two. Let us pretend to be here among the sugar cane and watch them as they steal by in single file, each with a hand on his dagger. They are forbidden by Peter to look in the least like him. They wear skins of bears slain by themselves, in which they are so round and furry when they fall and roll, they therefore have become very sure-footed. The first to pass is Tootles, not the least brave, but the most unfortunate of all that gallant band. He had been in fewer adventures than any of them, because the big things constantly happen when he had just stepped round the corner. All would be quiet. He would take the opportunity of going off to gather a few sticks for firewood, and then when he returned, others would be sweeping up the blood. This ill luck had given a gentle melancholy to his countenance, but instead of souring his nature, it had sweetened it, so that he was quite the humblest of the boys. Poor, kind Tootles, there is a danger in the air for you tonight. Take care, lest an adventure now offered to you, which, if accepted, will plunge you into the deepest woe. Tootles, the fairy Tink, who is bent on mischief this night, is looking for a tool, and she thinks you the most easily tricked of the boys. Where Tinkerbell? Would it that he hear us? But we are not really on the island, and he passes by, biting his knuckles. Next comes Nibs, the gay and debonair, followed by Slightly, who cuts his whistles out of trees and dances ecstatically to his own tunes. Slightly is the most conceited of the boys. He thinks he remembers the days before he was lost, with their manners and customs, and this has given his nose an offensive tilt. Curly is fourth. He is a pickle. And so often has he had to deliver up his person when Peter said sternly, Stand forth the one who did this thing. That now... At the command, he stands forth automatically whether he has done it or not. Last come the twins, who cannot be described because we should be sure to describing the wrong one. Peter never quite knew what the twins were, and his band were not allowed to know anything he did not know, so these two were always vague about themselves, and did their best to give satisfaction by keeping close together in an apologetic sort of way. The boys vanish in the gloom, and after a pause but not a long pause, for things go on briskly on the island, come the pirates on their track. We hear them before they are seen, and it is always the same dreadful song. A vast belay, yo-ho, heave to, a pirating we go, and if we are parted by a shot, we're sure to meet below. A more villainous-looking lot never hung on a row on an execution dock. Here, a little in advance, ever and again, with his head to the ground, listening, his great arms bare, pieces of eight in his ears as ornaments, in his handsome Italian Kecko, who cut his name in letters of blood on the back of the governor at the prison gal. 
The gigantic black behind him had many names, since he dropped the one which dusky mothers still terrify their children with on the banks of the Gorgano. Here is Bill Jukes, every inch of him tattooed, the same Bill Jukes who got six dozen on the walrus from Flint before he would drop the bag of Modores. And Cookson? He's said to be Black Murphy's brother, but this was never proved— and gentleman Starkey, once an usher in a public school, still dainty in his ways of killing. And Skylights, Morgan's Skylights, and the Irish bosun, an oddly general man who stabbed, so to speak, without offense, and was the only nonconformist in Hook's crew. And Noodler, whose hands were fixed on backwards, and Robot and Mullins and Alf Mason and many other ruffian known long and feared in the Spanish main. But in the midst of them, in the blackest and largest jewel of the dark setting, reclined James Hook, or so as he wrote himself, Jas Hook, of whom it was said he was the only man that the sea cooked feared. He lay at his ease in a rough chariot, drawn and propelled by his men, instead of a right hand, he had an iron hook, with whichever and anon he encouraged them to increase their pace. As dogs this terrible man treated, and addressed them as dogs they obeyed him. In person, he was a little cadaverous, black visit, and his hair was dressed in long curls, which at a little distance looked like black candles, and gave a singularly threatened expression to his handsome countenance. His eyes were of the blue forget-me-not, and a profound melancholy, save when he was plunging his hook into you, at which time gave two red spots appeared in them and lit them up horribly. Even he ripped you up with an air, and I have been told he was a racketeer of ill repute. He was never more sinister than when he was most polite, which is probably the truest test of breeding, and the elegance of his diction, even when he was swearing, no less than the distinction of his demeanor, showed him one of a different caste from his crew. A man of indomitable courage, it was said of him, and that the only thing he shied at was the sight of his own blood, which was thick and of an unusual color. In dress, he somewhat amped the attire associated with the name of Charles II, having heard it in some earlier period of his career that he bore a strange resemblance to the ill-fated Stuarts. In his mouth he had a holder of his own make, which enabled him to smoke two cigars at once. But undoubtedly, the grimmest part of him was the iron claw. Let us now kill a pirate, to show Hook's method. Skylights will do. As they pass, Skylight lurches clumsily against him, ruffling his lace collar. The hook shoots forth, and there is a tearing sound in one screech, and then the body is kicked aside, and the pirates pass on. He has not even taken the cigars from his mouth. Such a terrible man whom Peter is pitted. Which will win? On the trail of pirates, stealing noiselessly down the warpath, which is not visible to the inexperienced eyes, come the redskins. Every single one of them has eyes peeled. They carry tomahawks and knives, and their naked bodies gleam with paint and oil. Strung around them are scalps, of boys as well as pirates, for those of the Piccaninny tribe, not to be confused with the softer-hearted Delawares or the Hurons, in the van of all fours is the great little panther, a brave of so many scalps that his present position they somewhat impede his progress. Bringing up the rear, in the place of great danger comes Tiger Lily, proudly erect, a princess in her own right, she is the most beautiful of dusky Dianas, and a belle of the Piccaninnies. Coitish, cold, and amorous by turns, there is not a brave who would not have the wayward thing to wife. But she staves off the altar with a hatchet. Observe how they pass over fallen twigs without making the slightest noise. The only sound to be heard is their somewhat heavy breathing. The fact that they are all just a little fat now after heavily gorging— but in time, they will work this off. For the moment, however, it constitutes their chief danger. 
The redskins disappear as they have come, like shadows, and soon their place is taken by the beast. A great and motley procession, lions, tigers, bear, and the innumerable smaller savage things that flee from them, for every kind of beast, and more particularly, all the man-eaters, live cheek by jowl on the favored land. Their tongues hanging out, they are hungry tonight. When they have passed, comes the last figure of all, a gigantic crocodile. We shall see for whom she is looking presently. The crocodile passes, but soon the boys appear again, for the procession must continue indefinitely until one of the party stops or changes pace. Then quickly they will be on top of each other. All are keeping a sharp lookout in front, but none suspects that the danger may be creeping up from behind. This shows how real the island was. The first to fall out of the moving circle was the boys. They flung themselves down on the sward close to their underground home. I do wish Peter would come back, every one of them said nervously, though in height, and still more in breath, they were all larger than their captain. I am the only one who is not afraid of the pirates, slightly said, and in a tone that prevented him from being a general favorite. But perhaps some distant sound disturbed him, for he added hastily, But I wish he would come back and tell us whether he heard anything more about Cinderella. They talked of Cinderella, and Tootles was confident that his mother must have been very like her. It was only in Peter's absence that they could speak of mothers. The subject was forbidden by him as silly. Oh, I remember my mother, Nibs told them. And she said often to father, Oh, how I wish I had a checkbook of my own. I don't know what a checkbook is, but I should just love to give my mother one. When they talked, they heard a distant sound. You or I, not being wild things of the woods, would have heard nothing. But they heard it, and it was the grim song again. At once the lost boys. But where are they? They were no longer there. Rabbits could not have disappeared more quickly. I will tell you where they are, with the exception of Nibs, who has darted away. They are already in their home underground a very delightful residence of which we shall see a good deal of presently. But how they have reached it? For there is no entrance to be seen, not so much as a large stone, which if it rolled away would disclose the mouth of a cave. Look closely, however, and you may note that there are seven large trees, each with a hole in its hollow trunk, as large as a boy. These are the seven entrances to the home under the ground, for which Hook has been searching in vain these many moons. Will he find it tonight? As the pirates advanced, the quick eye of Starkey sighted Nibs disappearing through the wood. At once his pistol flashed out, but an iron claw gripped his shoulder. Captain, let go! he cried, writhing. Now, for the first time, we hear the voice of Hook. It was a black voice. Put back that pistol first, it said threateningly. It was one of the boys you hate. I could have shot him dead. Aye, and the sound would have brought Tiger Lily's redskins upon us. Do you want to lose your scalp? Shall I after him, Captain? asked pathetic Smee, and tickle him with Johnny Corkscrew. Smee had pleasant names for everything and his cutlass was Johnny Corkscrew, because he wriggled it around in the wound. One could mention many lovable traits in Smee. For instance, after killing, it was his spectacles he wiped instead of his weapon. Johnny's a silent fellow, he reminded Hook. Now Smee, Hook said darkly, he is the only one, and I want to mischief all seven. Scatter and look for them. The pirates disappeared among the trees and in the moment their captain and Smee were alone, Hook heaved a heavy sigh. And I know not why it was, perhaps because it was the soft beauty of the evening, but there came over him the desire to confide in his faithful bosun the story of his life. He spoke long and earnestly, but what it was all about, Smee, who was rather stupid, did not know in the least. Anon, he caught the word of Peter. Most of all, Hook was saying passionately, I want their captain, Peter Pan. Twas he who cut off my arm, he brandished the hook threateningly. I've waited long to shake his hand with this, and oh, I'll tear him. And yet, said Smee, 
I've often heard you say that the hook was worth the score of hands. For combing the hair and other homely uses? Aye, the captain answered. If I was a mother, I would pray to have my children born with this instead of that. And he cast the look of pride on the iron hand and the one of scorn upon the other. And then he frowned. Peter flung my arm, he said, wincing, to a crocodile that happened to be passing by. I have often, said Smee, noticed your strange dread of crocodiles. Not of crocodiles, Hook correct him, but of one crocodile. He lowered his voice. It liked my arm so much, Smee, that it has followed me ever since, from sea to sea, from land to land, licking its lips for the rest of me. In a way, said Smee, it's sort of a compliment. I want no such compliments, Hook barked petulantly. I want Peter Pan, who gave the brute its first taste of me. He sat down on a large mushroom and now there was a quiver in his voice. Smee, he said huskily, that crocodile would have had me before this, but by a lucky chance it swallowed a clock, which goes tick-tick inside it, and so before it can reach me, I hear the tick and bolt. <laughs> he laughed, but in a hollow way. Some day, said Smee, the clock will run down, and then he'll get you. Hook wetted his dry lips. I... And that is the fear that haunts me, he said. Since sitting down, he felt curiously warm. Smee, is the seat hot? He jumped up. Odds, bods, hammer and tongs, I'm burning! They examined the mushroom, which was a size and solidly known on the mainland, and they tried to pull it up. It came away at once in his hands because it had no roots. Stranger still, smoke began to ascend. Pirates looked at each other. A chimney, they both exclaimed. They had indeed discovered the chimney of the home underground. It was the custom of the boys to stop it with a mushroom when enemies were in the neighborhood. Not only smoke came out of it, but also came children's voices, for so safe did the boys feel in their hiding place that they were gaily chatting. The pirates listened grimly and then replaced the mushroom. They looked around them and noted the holes in the seven trees. Did you hear them say Peter Pan's from home? Smee whispered, fidgeting with Johnny Corkscrew. Hook nodded. He stood for a long time lost in thought, and at last a curdling smile lit up his swarthy face. Smee had been waiting for it. Unrip your plan, Captain, he cried eagerly. Turn to the ship, Hook replied slowly through his teeth and cook a large, rich cake of jolly thickness with green sugar on it. There can be but one room below, for this is but one chimney. The silly moles had not the sense to see that they did not need a door apiece. That shows they have no mother. We will leave the cake on the shore of the mermaid's lagoon. These boys are always swimming about there, playing with mermaids. They will find the cake and they will gobble it up, because having no mother, they don't know how dangerous it is to eat a rich, damp cake. He burst into laughter. Not hollow laughter now, but honest laughter. <laughs> they will die. Smee had listened with growing admiration. Tis the wickedest, prettiest policy I've ever heard of, he cried. And in their execution, they danced and sang. A vast belay when I appear, be fear they overtook. Not left upon your bones when you have shaken claws with cook. They began the verse, but they never finished it. For a sound broke, and it stilled them. It was at first such a tiny sound that a leaf might have fallen on it and smothered it. But it came more near, as it was more distant. Tick, 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 tick. Hook stood shuddering, one foot in the air. A crocodile, he gasps and bounded away, followed by his bosun. It was indeed the crocodile. It had passed the redskins, who were now on the trail of other pirates, and oozed on after Hook. Once more the boys emerged into the open, but the dangers of the night were not yet over, for presently Nibs rushed breathless into their midst, pursued by a pack of wolves. 
The tongues of the pursuers were hanging out, and the baying of them was horrible. Save me, save me, cried Nibs, falling onto the ground. But what can we do? What can we do? It was a high compliment to Peter that in that dire moment their thoughts turned to him. What would Peter do? they cried simultaneously. Almost in the same breath they cried, Peter would look at him through his legs. And then, let us do what Peter would do. It was quite the most successful way of defying wolves. And as one, they bent and looked through their legs. The next moment is a long one, but victory came quickly. For as the boys advanced upon them in this terrible attitude, the wolves dropped their tails and fled. Now Nibs rose from the ground, and the others thought that his staring eyes still saw the wolves. But it was not wolves they saw. I have seen a wonderful thing, he cried, gathered around him eagerly. A great white bird. It's flying this way. What kind of bird do you think? I don't know, Nibs said awestruck, but it looks so weary as it flies. Poor Windy. Poor Windy. I remember, said Slightly instantly, that there are birds called Wendy's. See, it comes, cried Curly, pointing to Windy in the heavens. Wendy was now almost overhead. They could hear her plaintive cry, but more distinct came the shrill voice of Tinkerbell, the jealous fairy that had now cast off all disguise of friendships and was darting at her victim from every direction, pinching savagely each time she touched. Hello, Tink, cried the wandering boys. Tink's reply ran out. Peter wants you to shoot the Wendy. It was not in their nature to question a Peter order. Let's do what Peter wishes, cried the boys. Quick, bows and arrows. All but Tootles popped down their trees. He had a bow and arrow with him, and Tink noted it and rubbed her little hands. Quick, Tootles, quick, she screamed. Peter will be so pleased. Tootles excitedly fixed an arrow into his bow "'Out of the way, Tink!' he shouted, and then he fired, and Wendy fluttered to the ground with an arrow in her breast.' 